Okay, next up um, we have James Clark. He's fresh off the train from York to speak to us today. Um, I'm very excited about this presentation because um, I saw James came last year, it was about this, this time last year actually, to, to Imperial and to speak to a much, a much smaller audience about, about his group's work and the work of the, the Green Chemistry Network. And I was so excited by, by this research, especially I remember uh, talking about taking the, the millions of tonnes of orange peel that are um, put into landfill in California and Brazil every year and extracting useful chemicals like limonene which can be used to replace you know, chlorobenzene and other sort of solvents. Um, just, I thought it was just the kind of clever and innovative science that we, that we want to be thinking about today. So I'm delighted that James has made it back for us this year um, to speak to you guys about how to take us from, from waste to wealth using green chemistry. So please give a big, big a hand. Please. Well, it says on. It is on. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. Uh, thanks to Sarah for the. Um, oops, maybe it's just I'll put it on my tie instead. For the invitation, and uh, thanks for the kind of pre the talk just before that actually, because as you can tell from the title of my talk, it kind of fits in rather well in terms of entrepreneurship and um, actually sort of making money out of science, which some scientists still don't think is a good thing to do. But um, I'm sure you don't believe that, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So, um, well, obviously I'm a chemist. I do come here, as you gather, I was here last year. In fact, I've been coming here every year for the last few years as an external examiner. So it's quite nice to kind of come here in a different, uh, wearing a different hat. So um, I'm a chemist and I'm surrounded now by chemistry buildings here. So uh, despite that, I'm not going to talk a lot about, I mean, obviously everything I'm talking about is relevant to chemistry, but I've deliberately taken out, you know, a lot of the more chemistry things because I'm assuming, in fact, I know this is a much broader audience. So um, having said all that, I am a chemist. I work in somewhere called the Green Chemistry Centre at the University of York. There's um, almost getting on for 100 people there now, and we're all kind of working towards the sort of mission, if you like, which is to try to um, do chemistry in a way that's more um, environmentally compatible, but also do that in a way which is very exciting, very interesting, very innovative, and also with all sorts of interesting opportunities for um, entrepreneurship. But in particular, what we're interested in is anything to do with um, chemicals. Because we know chemicals are, uh, well, you all know, chemicals are intrinsic to everything uh, that we use. Chemists will be telling you this all the time. If you're not a chemist already, I'm sure you've heard this message before. And in particular, we're sort of looking at anything which basically contains any of these items here. And in a way, the fun thing about what I do is that I can, uh, I can you know, one day I can be talking to people working in cosmetics. Another day I can be talking to people working in uh, pharmaceuticals. So um, in pharmaceuticals, so I was, uh, I'm sure that works anyway, no So in pharmaceuticals, like two weeks ago, I was in a meeting in Helsinki, something called the Innovative Medicines Initiative, which is a huge pan-European program. And it's all about the pharmaceutical industry wanting to reduce its, well, they say carbon footprint. I try to make them think environmental footprint because maybe for reasons that will become apparent in a few minutes. Carbon, I think, is a bit limiting. But anyway, they want to reduce the environmental impact of the processes for making pharmaceuticals. So their big issue is making the drugs because on the whole, their resource efficiency the amount of the, uh, what they consume compared to what they put out in terms of products is only about 1%. They know that, and so does the NHS. So the NHS has basically told them that because they identify a major contribution to their carbon footprint is the pharmaceuticals. Therefore, they say to the industry, you've got to reduce your far carbon footprint. How do you reduce your carbon footprint? You actually make your process greener. So that's the driver for that industry. It's all about resource efficiency. But in different industries, you get very different drivers. So for example, I'll come on in a moment to talk more about electronics or things relevant to electronics. So the mobile phone, which I'm sure all of you have on your pocket, maybe more than one. In fact, it's kind of an interesting debate. I was in an RSC, Royal Society of Chemistry meeting the other day, and it started off by asking people how many mobile phones they had on them. And this was a bunch of academics, so you know, 99% said one, and one person had two, and they got shocked looks, you know my word. <laughs> but in other, in other audiences, you'll get a very different reaction. Uh, you know, the, uh, the current uh, highest number of mobile phones per person in the world is Japanese teenage girls who have an average of four mobile phones because they're 
they're color coordinated with, uh, with their outfits, you know? <laughs> so it's very interesting how the mobile phone has evolved into a fashion accessory, essentially. Um, but of course, every mobile phone also consumes very large quantities of resources. And we also, we only keep a mobile phone in this country for about six months of useful time. So therefore, it's not a very good example of resource efficiency again. And there we have all sorts of interesting, uh, interesting issues about the resources being consumed to make the mobile phone, as will become apparent in a moment. Um, cosmetics, and uh, you know, if you'd said to me two years ago, I'd be working in hair care, I'd have thought you were mad, but actually I was approached by Procter & Gamble a couple of years ago, and they said, we have a challenge for you, and that's to try and green the hair care industry. And I thought, come on, you know, we've got more important things to do. And then we kind of listened, and half the audience, looking at the, uh, because it is a very sex biased thing, you know, definitely women will appreciate this far more than men, but half the audience will probably understand more, if not for yourselves, than maybe for your mums or for your aunties or whatever, because 10 million people in the UK alone go to have their hair dyed or topped up every month. It's incredible. And the thing about these hairstyles, I never appreciated it before, you know? Um, I, when I said this to my wife afterwards, she said, yeah. So it's kind of like a guilty secret. But in reality, there's an enormous number of people go to get their hair dyed on a regular basis. And the UK is by no means the highest proportion of people doing this. And even in the middle of a jungle of Africa, you'll find a hair salon. They're incredible. They're everywhere. Now, think about it from a resource and resource efficiency point of view. And it's not good news, you know, because basically you've got people in the hair salon and they're mixing chemicals together. They're not trained. They're mixing chemicals together on your head, right? <laughs> doing chemistry on your head. They're then applying heat just to carry on the chemical reaction concept, okay? And then they wash 90% of it down the drain. And you pay a fortune for this. Amazing. <laughs> about 100 pounds, I think, is the average uh, amount paid by somebody going into a hair salon. So very poor resource efficiency. Very cons most of the resources they consume are petroleum derived, so you know they won't last forever, and enormous waste problems. So then a life cycle point of view, you've got issues all the way across. And uh, one other example, which is one of my favorites as well, which is the plastic bag, you know, because the plastic bag has uh, gone from being a convenience item to being a bad thing. It's amazing how I went to a meeting of the um, European Plastics Federation a year or so ago, a year or so ago in Brussels. And they were sitting there with their collars turned up and, you know, sort of dark glasses on because they're kind of embarrassed now to say they work in plastics because the plastic bag has become cursed as an example of something we are making very poor use of. And to some extent that's true, although I don't think necessarily people understand what the problem is. It's not really a resource problem, although most plastic bags are made from a non-renewable resource, petroleum. The amount they use really is very, very small. The process efficiency is fantastic. You know, if I said pharmaceuticals operate at 1% process efficiency, plastic bag manufacturing must be well over 90%, really very efficient. The big issue there is us and how we use the resource, the product. We take a plastic bag and then we, we throw it away. We don't think about it, you know, in terms of how we use it thereafter. Some people do. I mean, I'm anal about this. You know, I've got bags full of bags, cupboards full of bags full of bags, you know, so <laughs> I never throw anything away. And in fact, recently I was, uh, I, was, I, was shown, I, was, I was shown off the premises at Sainsbury's for taking photographs of plastic bags blowing in the trees because to me, that's the real problem because we're so bad at controlling our resource, the plastic bag escapes and then, of course, ends up in the environment and you'll all have heard or should have heard about the plastic islands, for example, forming in the Pacific. If not, just check it out on the website. It's very easy to see, you know, which is a consequence of our poor management of the product. So wherever you look in these in these different sort of uh, articles, there are issues, and the issues can be resource issues, they can be process issues, they can be product issues, they can be all of those. And, you know, the consequences of all this is, is that really, you know, the pressures on chemical manufacturers and chemical users are going up all the time, and they're going up really across the full life cycle. So they're going up uh, in terms of the resource issues I've implied, in terms of the process issues, handling chemicals becomes more and more difficult, more and more demanding. And they're going up in terms of product issues. So you see the three key stages in the life cycle here. So I always say, first thing to understand about green chemistry and sustainability is it's a life cycle issue. I don't say do an LCA every time you think about something because that will be too demanding. But do think about these issues. When you make a change somewhere, like I'm going to change my product, I'm not going to use a plastic bag made from polyethylene. I'm going to use a plastic bag made from cornstarch. You've got to think all the way up up the supply chain, think about the key life cycle stages, stages of resources, processes, and products. And then we get to this amazing amount of legislation which is hitting products. 
And there's something called REACH, which again, I hope most of you have heard about, the one at the top right there. REACH is the big daddy of all chemical legislation. It's the European legislation that controls the use of chemical substances. It's enormously important. Its effects are rippling throughout the entire industry, not just chemical manufacturing or pharmaceutical manufacturing, but all the people I showed you before making all of those articles that you want to consume, your mobile phone, your plastic bag, your hair dyes, all those things use chemicals, and all those chemicals will be subject to, water, subject to control by REACH, this legislative process, which is only just beginning to happen now. So this, all this sort of added together means that people are, chemists get a bit paranoid actually because the pressures on them are greater than they've ever been before. And yet at the same time, the opportunities are much greater as well because you, know, you think, well, all those articles I showed you before, more and more people want them. As I said, more and more people are using mobile phones. More and more people want to visit hair salons. More and more people want to drive cars, you know? So in all these places, the demand for chemicals goes up and up and up. But at the same time, the pressures are building up. And if you think about it, the resource efficiency is a big issue, but equally, you've got these enormous issues around resources and around what happens at the end, which essentially is what we call waste. We're running out of resources and we're generating too much waste. And I, I think a while ago I thought, well, surely the two, the two are connected, you know, because what was a resource a minute ago, sometimes literally a minute ago, has suddenly become a waste. So, you know, surely why, is it, why do we call it a waste? What does waste mean? And this is really what I wanted to focus on in this talk, is just think about, give examples, and think about some of the opportunities as we move away from the traditional way of doing chemistry and making chemicals for all the things I showed you before, which is get something out the ground, process it in a typically not very efficient way, turn it into something we want, and then let that person who've used it, the mobile phone for six months, the hair dye for a matter of minutes, the plastic bag for 30 minutes, whatever it is, and then just let them discard it and set up a system in the country that says, we'll take your waste away from you, you don't have to worry about it. And then watch, you know, uh, newspapers like the Daily Mail, I've always got about at least one dig at the Daily Mail in every talk I give, you know, will then tell you how disgraceful it is that the society's got the nerve, you know, the government's got the nerve to charge you to take your waste away. I mean, it's outrageous, isn't it? You know, that's what you pay our taxes for. Surely that people come and take all of our resources away and put them in a hole in the ground. Yeah, if you, it's just so stupid. But this is basically, you know, where we're at in terms of the need to shift away from what sometimes people call the linear economy. You know, extract, process, consume, dispose. That's been our way of lives. And if you think about it, that doesn't make a lot of sense. It's certainly not sustainable. And, be, and one of the consequences of this, of course, because we lim, live in a very limited ecosphere, this is the planet Earth. And I know people talk about mining the asteroids and that sort of thing. I'd rather not rely on that, thank you very much, you know. <laughs> so for my next mobile phone, my next Apple gadget or whatever it is. So let's just think about more practically about what we can do li limit, living in this limited ecosphere. And in particular, we are now discovering that we are running out of things that we've taken for granted. Now, this is not meant to be up to date. Some of you may well be aware of other versions of this. There's all sorts of different versions floating around on the web at the moment. We did this about three years ago before it really became a big news story. And we published it in an engineering journal, which seemed to take forever to get published. But anyway, it did eventually get published. And it was basically addressing this issue of there's more to it than carbon. As I said before, we've been really pretty obsessed about carbon for the last several years. Now, I'm not saying we, need, we don't have to worry about carbon. We do have to worry about carbon. But carbon is, a, is very unusual compared to most elements because carbon has a very interesting life cycle of its own, really. If you think about the carbon cycle, carbon exists in solid form, like coal, like plants, like us. It exists in, uh, in gaseous form as well, of course, most famously carbon dioxide, methane, etc., etc. And there are these interesting cycles because we are part of the cycle, nature is part of the cycle. So carbon's constantly turning over. And the issue with carbon really is, you know, that we've been draining a very a resource that's been accumulated over a long period of time and transferring it from the terosphere into the atmosphere in a very short period of time. And that doesn't sound like a clever thing to do. Absolutely correct. But because we've only focused on carbon and we've been like kind of, we must reduce our carbon footprint, whatever it takes, we've been consuming other elements like there's no tomorrow. So, you know, the elements mentioned there in red, don't worry if you can't read them in detail, but things like indium, silver, antimony, germanium, hafnium, 
and a whole bunch of others, they are now at the stage where if we carry on the way we've been using them for the last few years, they're going to run out in our lifetimes, even in my lifetime, you know, certainly in your lifetimes. They're running out quickly. And there's other ones there which are in sort of more orangey or yellowy. They are going to be an issue, if not in this generation, the next generation, if we carry on consuming them in the same way we've done for the last 10, 20, 30 years. It's actually in some ways worse than this because there are elements here which I haven't really noted. Lithium there isn't shaded, but actually lithium really should now be shaded because we're using lithium to make batteries at a great rate. Some of the elements here are being consumed at a far greater rate than we have done before because of low carbon technologies, because of batteries for hybrid cars, because of wind turbines, because of all sorts of things which in their own right are good but we've done it without thinking about the other consequences. And as a result, we are now in panic mode. Go into Brussels now and talk about this sort of thing. And there's general panic. I mean, you know, once they've stopped panicking over Cyprus or the latest EU crisis, there are people there who are thinking a bit longer term and they recognize the fact that actually this is a big issue because it impacts on so many different industries. Electronics in particular, but it also impacts on chemical manufacturing. So back to pharmaceuticals. I mean, the industry, the pharmaceutical industry, consumes a huge amount of things like palladium as catalysts for running those processes, which aren't very efficient. Well, the palladium catalyzer ones actually are, but most of the others aren't. So, you know, this is a big issue. Wherever you are in the industry, you're worried about this. This is a serious concern. It's like, well, you know, well, this is madness because these elements, most of these elements don't have the kind of cycles I was talking about before. I mean, something like germanium, we don't have a lot of germanium compounds in the atmosphere. There are not many volatile germanium compounds. So actually, we take germanium from an ore, we process it, we make a mobile phone or whatever it is, and then we actually take the mobile phone after a while and put it in a landfill site, if we're not very careful. So the germanium moves from part of an ore into part of a waste site. And bear in mind that we now use something like 50, is it 50 plus different elements in every mobile phone now? It's amazing, you know, how many different elements we use to make modern electronic devices. And obviously we're shifting them from an ore into a waste. And that means we haven't shifted them in a way we can get them back again either. We haven't designed, we haven't been denied by design. We haven't thought about how we're gonna get those metals back again. Do you know the concentration of gold in your mobile phone is higher than in the virgin ore that it was originally extracted from? It's amazing. So very high concept. The Japanese are aware of this, and they are beginning to burn a lot of e-waste to generate ha ashes, which contain really high concentrations of some of these elements. So there are some people aware of it, but on the whole, we're sort of looking at this and panicking, but not doing a great deal about it. Certainly nothing constructive, apart from looking around the globe and seeing who's got what's left. So don't worry about the details of these bar charts. Look at the size of the bar chart and look and see how big, for example, the bar is in South Africa. Whoa, South Africa's got a lot of those critical elements. Brussels has this label called critical elements or valuable elements. There's different words, but it all comes down to the same thing. South Africa's got a lot. There's quite a few in Latin America, some in North America, a lot in Australia. Anybody been to Australia recently? Geez, you know, they're, they're partying big time, you know? They have never had it so good. You can't afford to go to Australia, by the way, because the value of the dollar is so incredibly high. They're having a great time. <laughs> They've totally forgot the environment in the process, by the way, but anyway. Uh, Asia, yeah, but look at Europe. There's a bit of a blip at Poland. Western Europe has got not a lot, you know? We really have very poor resources in Western Europe. Um, Eastern Europe has a bit, Finland's got a bit, you know, as you move east you get some, but on the whole we do, and that's another reason the EU is still the world's largest economy, the, the largest consumer of resources. But we're running out, so, you know, and we have to rely on places like, you know, South Africa, politically very, very vulnerable, other parts of the world which are not exactly very stable, so how much share potential here there is there for, um, you know, for basically political blackmail, for people using this to, you know, control all sorts of other things. So this is going to happen. It's definitely going to happen. So there's a real geopolitical slant to this. And when geopolitics get involved, things do tend to happen. So there are movements occurring in this space, which look very interesting. But, you know, fundamentally, it comes down to this, what I said before, is this, uh, you know, extract, uh, process, uh, consume, dispose type of mentality, which doesn't make sense. And what we're doing is turning our elements from a resource 
to a product and then to a waste. And this is what we do with a waste. So then we get something we don't want anymore. So, you know, you all are wearing things, carrying things, using things, driving things, which after a while you'll decide you don't want anymore. So what happens at that stage? Well, the answer is, in many countries, not a lot. This is most, most of European countries, plus the USA and Japan. There's very little data. We have great difficulty gathering data for some of the BRICs, you know, the developing countries. The data, I know China is beginning to look at waste interestingly. And as ever, they're very clever about this and very entrepreneurial. So I was in one big, big Chinese city where they had a lot of pharmaceutical manufacturing. And they actually, wherever there was a pharmaceutical company, there were little satellite companies that appeared around and they were taking their waste streams and processing them to make things. So they are, they are moving into this area fairly quickly. But this is the official data. And you can see in Eastern Europe, like Puro Bulgaria, anybody here from Bulgaria? Because as far as we can tell, they put everything in a hole in the ground, you know? They have a very simple waste management policy, hole in the ground. <laughs> now, you go all the way up to, I was in the Netherlands at the weekend, uh, you know, there you can see they're a bit more managed, Denmark, Germany. Famously, they do have more interesting waste management policies. Uh, they do burn a lot of waste. Some people may argue about that. If you do it in a controlled way, I think it's better than putting it in a hole in the ground, because if you put it in a hole in the ground, all you're doing is losing that resource and you're leaching stuff out of it, potentially, into the environment. So, you know, that's not, I don't think, a good idea. Japan, as I mentioned before, is the most proactive. They landfill very little. And there's all sorts of other, there's inter fascinating stories around this. Hong Kong, its landfill sites are now 98% full. Hong Kong really is panicking over what to do. And therefore, there's all sorts of really interesting programs running in Hong Kong, like there's guys going around bakeries and Starbucks. So Starbucks are actually sponsoring, only in Hong Kong, people to go around collecting waste streams coming out of Starbucks, like, you know, waste bakery and waste coffee ground and this sort of stuff, to collect them and do something with them. So there is some, again, because they have to, because they really are worried. If they can't fill, if they can't put it in their own holes of the ground, they'll have to go into their mainland brother, China, and they don't want to do that for all sorts of political reasons that I'm sure you can appreciate. So this is another big driver for change, but it also tells us again fundamentally that we're being very, very resource stupid. And a very good term I heard in Brussels a while ago is resource intelligent. We have to learn to be resource intelligent and stop thinking about something that's no longer fit for purpose in terms of what we originally bought it for as something we don't want and we want to get rid of. And we'll even pay people to come and take it away. That really is pretty mad. So this is what we end up with, lots and lots of waste and electronic waste and uh, forestry waste and food waste. I'll talk about food waste a bit more later. Paper waste, you know, pa paper, so it's okay, we recycle our paper, yeah? We've tracked, we've followed paper that's supposedly been for recycling. So my part, my part of the world in Yorkshire, so basically we've tracked this, it goes to the docks in Humberside, and it sits there in huge containers in the docks in Humberside, waiting for an empty container ship from China. And when there is an empty container ship, they fill up the container ship, it goes back to China, China reprocesses it and sells it back to us. Yeah, brilliant. And if there's no empty container ship, they put it in a hole on the ground. So, you know, not really very clever. You know, we could, we could do a lot more. So wherever you look, there's all sorts of interesting issues. Even when we think we recycle, we're not very clever. So just briefly, what we do at York is we take various technologies, processing technologies, to take those waste streams and make products. So we are driven by this belief that the future resources have to be what we call today wastes, the stuff that people don't want. We don't want to use anything that's competitive with food or anything else. We want to take the stuff you don't want and process it to get chemical goodies out because everything's full of chemicals. So surely we can be clever enough to take advantage of all these different wastes. Here's one, just a couple of minor examples. This is quite a nice one. You may have come across this before. It's in collaboration with our friends in plant biology. And it takes advantage of, a, of a, something that's been known for many years, which is plants have this natural ability to extract things out of the ground, like metals. I had no idea how much metal concentration they can take, but some plants, it seems, can take like 50% of their own root weight as metals. So it's called phytomining, and we're now working in a project with people in, uh, in various parts of the world to use plants to capture metals directly out of the ground. So you can imagine planting metals, say, in landfill areas or in other places where there's high concentration of metals, as I'll, as I'll show you in a moment. So it could be, for example, just alongside the highway. So when we drive a car, waste streams are all over the place. You know, when you're driving your car, we're actually spewing out large amounts of uh, waste, precious metals, notably palladium. And as you can see, you know, 170,000 kilos of palladium consumed just for caps 
in 2010. Palladium, by the way, was one of those shaded elements. It's also critical to the pharmaceutical industry. So there's widespread concern, if not panic yet, about palladium and whether we should carry on using it and what we do. Well, you can collect stuff coming out the back of cars. So, you know, the palladium emissions coming out of the exhaust fumes, coming out of the soil, in the dust, in the grass, in runoff water, are significant. These are significant amounts of palladium. And there are people now in the highways of California who are just basically collecting up the shrubs and taking them away to extract the metals and making a business out of it. So, you know, the potential's there. This is something, by the way, that happened 40 years ago. So when catalytic converters first came out in the 1960s in California, driven by the Clean Air Act, the first Clean Air Act in California, basically what happened was the catalytic converters were so badly designed, you could almost see the petals being coming out of the tailpipe. And so people were collecting this and making money. Then the efficiency of the cats got better and better, so the quantities being lost were getting smaller and smaller. So those numbers are very small compared to what they were 40 years ago, but they're still significant, still enough to make a business out of because the price of these things is so high. So that's one area, and this is the project where we're taking these plants, processing them, and directly making catalysts. So we say, okay, let's take a waste, for example, mine tailings near a mine, landfill waste, it could be by a motorway, a highway, and let's take the plant with the metal in and turn that directly into a catalyst because we know we, own, we use palladium not just for catalytic converters, but also for catalysts for chemical processes. So this is our kind of thinking. Let's try and short circuit the processing, take a waste and turn it very quickly and maybe just one step into something you can use, maybe for a very different sort of application. So that's the kind of logic of the things we do. So that's metals. Metals are absolutely vital. You will hear so much more about those over the next few years. But we mustn't forget carbon. I said before we mustn't just be obsessed about carbon, absolutely, but we mustn't forget carbon. Carbon, we are carbon. By a, nature's carbon-based. You know, this is, with, whichever way you look at it, carbon is absolutely fundamental to us now and to our future. Therefore, we have to think about how we use carbon in our processes to make all those things that we want that contain carbon, include the things we wear, sit on, eat, and so on. And what we need to do is basically think about more sustainable sources of carbon because what we have today is not sustainable. So this is the petroleum industry, which again has been rather cursed in recent years, but in a way it's a bit unfair because it's a very, very efficient industry. You know what I said before about pharmaceutical manufacturing being so inefficient? Pharma petroleum processing is incredibly efficient, really brilliant example of efficiency. It's been running for years. They've got it down to a fine art. It's also a wonderful example of symbiosis, of a relationship between two very different sectors. Energy, which is where its consumption first started, and chemicals. So the combination of the two makes the industry successful. You know, half the value of petroleum in the United States is chemicals. But hardly anybody talks about that. Everyone goes on about the fuel value, the energy value, the price at the pump, and this sort of thing. And yet, actually, the price of petroleum is affecting everything they use, additional to their cars and their, um, you know, their fuel bills. So this is something which, again, we can't continue this way. Even though it's really efficient, the resource that it's, that it's using is running out. You can argue about how long it's got to last, and, you know, it's a bit like the metals, you know. So I've heard people from various organizations say, yeah, but there's no problem. The metals aren't going away. Absolutely, they're just being transferred into difficult states. And then other people say, well, just dig more holes. Okay, carry on digging holes. Like you can still find more oil in places like the Gulf of Mexico, like Alaska, like the tar sands. Yeah, sure. There are other reserves of all these things available, but the cost economically and environmentally is going up and up all the time. The easy stuff is gone, and now we're looking at the much more difficult stuff. So, you know, fundamentally, this is not a sustainable model. So why don't we think about something which is sustainable for carbon? And the only thing that makes any sense at all is what we call biomass. Biomass, we are biomass, by the way. So, you know, if you want to give your body to the chemical industry at the end, you know, then that's an interesting thought. Maybe, who knows? So biomass is anything that we don't use currently for, I guess we are using, I don't mean now, by the way. We are using our bodies now. So, you know, and, you know, we do tend to use a lot of biomass for feeding our bodies and feeding the animals that then feed us and so on. So, you know... Biomass does have value. I'm not talking about taking the stuff away that people are currently using usefully. I'm talking about all the stuff people don't want. And there's plenty of it. And we know in all those examples, that's all, they're all proven. This isn't speculative. We know we can make fuels. You know about biodiesel and bioethanol. 
buy a plastics and buy a lubricants, buy a solvents and buy everything, you know? Everything that involves organic carbon, there's probably a buyer replacement out there. The challenge is making it commercially viable, keeping the price down, making it you know, attractive to a large market, which helps, of course, to keep the price down. So these are challenges ahead. And the one we like is food waste or food supply chain waste. So anything from the factory to the fork, sorry, from the farm to the fork. So, you know, the farmer wastes a lot of carbon. He doesn't use all the straws. That's a myth that people think they do. They don't. There's a lot of straw waste, which sometimes they're pelletizing and selling to the local power station to burn, which is a very limited use of a very precious resource. But around the cocoa pods in Africa, 20 million tons a year, just left rotting in the fields. In Vietnam, they burn over 20 million tons of rice straw in open fields. Imagine the carbon burden on the environment from doing that. And to me, what a waste. All these things are enormous waste. Wherever you look, even in Europe, even in processing food. I was in Covent Garden last year. You wouldn't believe how much fruit and vegetable waste is thrown away at Covent Garden. You know, I'll come back to my friend. You heard about oranges before. I've got to think about oranges. And uh, I went to one juicer in Covent Garden. All he does is make juice for five-star hotels in London. He throws away six tons of orange peel a day. Somebody comes. He pays this guy to come and take it away, and they stick it in a hole in the ground. Ah, uh, you know, but you can smell the chemicals in orange peel. Come on. You know, it's a no-brainer. It's so obvious. And wherever you look, you know, you're, it's amazing. Brazil's fabulous. I mean, I go to Brazil quite a lot because Brazil... You know, everything grows in Brazil incredibly fast. You can almost see the stuff growing. And it's amazing, you know, when you see how much food supply chain waste there is in Brazil, staggering volumes of bananas and coconuts and oranges and sugar cane bagasse and all sorts of stuff, you know, just looking, begging to be used for making things. People are beginning to do a little bit, not nearly enough. Potential there is fantastic. Because you can make all sorts of things. This is just, we know all this. We know we can make waxes and we can make chemical intermediates. We can make fuels. We can make plastics. We can make keelants to go in your hair dye to capture the metals that enable the hair dye to work, and so on. All these things are known. We can do all this. You know, the challenge, as I say, is to do the, get the volumes up and get the prices down. All these types of chemicals can be made from food supply chain waste. There is a huge range of possibilities. A few examples. Here's one we started a few years ago, and it was a kind of, um, I guess, a classic green chemistry challenge. The challenge was a big carpet company called Interface, the biggest manufacturer of carpets in the world, and they came to us and they said, we've got a problem, and our problem is landfill. 98, 99% of all of our carpets end up in a hole in the ground. Even though when you finish with this bit of carpet, this is all carpet tiles, you can see the carpet tiles here. If you look at a carpet tile, maybe don't pull it up now, you might get in trouble, but when you, no, no one's looking, just pull up a corner, have a look. You'll see several layers. At the top, you've probably got nylon. You've got some bitumen backing. You've got some, all sorts of adhesive. You've got glass fiber in there. Quite a few different things go in there to make a carpet tile. They're designed to last for about 10 years, which sounds about reasonable. So quite good lifetime, really, compared to many things. But the problem is, when you decide you don't want the carpet tile, it's not because the materials are no good. It's because you don't like the color. It looks a bit worn, whatever it is. You know, you're rebuilding. So what happens to those carpet tiles? Well, they can't use them again because the adhesive is so powerful, you can't unzip. You can't unstick the different bits. So everything's been stuck together. Again, it's not benign by design. So our approach was, let's take a food waste, a starchy food waste, which everyone knows starch can make adhesives. So we made a variation on that, which said, OK, we can start making those uh, carpet tiles with adhesives, which actually allow you, when you finish with the carpet tile, as a carpet tile, to separate the layers and use the layers again. And this was, we did this on a full-scale manufacturing plant up near Bradford in West Yorkshire, and it worked a treat. You can actually take the carpet tiles and, as I say, you can recycle the components and use the nylon again, for example, to make other types of maybe not quite so high quality, but you can still make some other carpet tiles. You can take the bitumen, you can maybe burn it to get some energy back. You know, the thing is you can recover and reuse the components so they're not just a single use end of life. We can take the same starchy food waste and make carbonaceous solids, which are used in all sorts of applications like catalysts, water purification, and so on. And since, you know, previous talk was talk about entrepreneurship, so this is one of our spin-out companies. So we took that technology and made a company called Starbon Technologies Limited. It's brand new, so I can't answer the questions you were asking before about is it a success? We don't know yet. We hope it is, of course. And we have all, I mean, what I heard at the end of your talk was spot on. We know all those sorts of issues about 
And even when you find a VC who wants to invest, you've got to be careful who you get into bed with, you know, because some of these guys are different. So, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah. but anyway, the principle is great. Just you've got to think your way through, like all things. Solvents are a massive issue. I just mention these because, you know, they're very relevant to the pharmaceutical manufacturing and the processing I was telling you before. And again, bio-derived possibilities like I've got there. Limonene from orange peel is a great solvent. CO2, carbon dioxide, is actually a very good solvent, you know? Carbon dioxide, again, has become the bad boy, like plastic bags. Everyone thinks CO2 is a bad guy. It's fundamental to life. And in processing, it can be really useful. If you condense CO2 into a liquid, or even a supercritical liquid, it becomes a really good solvent. And when it's a solvent, you can extract things, like you can extract chemicals from straws and peels and woody waste. All the sort of things I showed you before are covered in chemicals. I'm a bit like Prince Charles. When I go into a place I haven't been to before, I start feeling the surface of plants, not so I can communicate with them, but because I'm actually touching up their chemicals. And it's, you know, because they're thick. And some plants, you know, one, two, I mean, typical wheat straw, will have about 2% by weight of surface chemicals. You go into somewhere like uh, palm leaves, you know where the climate's so different, 10% by weight of a palm leaf is surface chemicals. Incredible. You can literally peel it off. You can, you can take a knife and scrape it off. It's amazing, you know? So why don't we use those chemicals? People some collectively call them waxes. You know, in this country, we import all of our waxes. And I'm saying, bloody hell, you know, we're surrounded by waxes. Every plant out there is covered in waxes. Why don't we just take the waxes off plants? But we don't. We take them, them petroleum derived, we take them from non renewable resources and so on. And it's very interesting. Waxes are becoming quite a political issue as well because a very interesting conversation with a kind of wax expert. And I said, you know, he said to me, I bet you don't know, who is the world's biggest user of waxes? Anybody care? It's the Roman Catholic Church <laughs> for making candles. Now, as it happens, back to China again, every gram of wax on the planet goes through China at some point in time, processing raw materials somewhere. China controls every wax supply chain. So the Roman Catholic Church is totally paranoid now because there's an atheistic state is controlling now, you know, this, this major product for them. So, you know, so... Uh, we expect the new pope to get involved in this and to be preaching for green chemistry uh, because, well. And we love our microwaves. Just mentioning a few technologies. Microwaves are great technology for processing food. You all know that. You can actually use microwaves for processing biomass as well, for getting out oils. So uh, we've got a big microwave of all sorts of microwaves. And the biggest one we've got is about the size of these two tables combined together, a big thing. And uh, two weeks ago, we were processing uh, pork scratchings. And it's like, oh, lovely, you know? and garlic butter, and waste mayonnaise. Do you have any idea how much waste mayonnaise? We produce this in Yorkshire. It's a bit of a thing in Yorkshire, you know? People like dipping their chips in it. So I've been literally standing in a factory watching tanker loads of waste mayonnaise coming in. Bloody hell. Well, you know, otherwise they just landfill it. So we strip off the oils, and the oils can be used to make biodiesel, for example, and other things. So strip off the chemicals from these different waste streams, because we're, if we are so casual about our resources, let's try and get something back again from them. So we can look at, I won't develop this, this biorefinery flow chart to prove how efficient the thing is. We can take something like wheat straw and develop a very complicated biorefinery where we can show how we can extract chemicals, process residues, make energy products, make chemical products, make waxes, make all sorts of things. And at the end, if you can't do anything else, burn it. You know, Drax, near to me, is the world's, sorry, Europe's largest coal-fired power station, Drax. And they're going to be burning between 15 and 20 million tonnes of biomass a year from 2015. The UK doesn't have between 15 and 20 million tonnes of biomass, even if we do all volunteer to go and jump in the burners of Drax. So they're importing it. So they import from, for example, they're importing wood from Western Canada. And I said to them, well, it doesn't sound very sustainable and very green to me. Oh, no, we've done the calculations. We can show our carbon cycle is actually fine. I don't believe them. I do not believe them. Surely it can't be right importing wood from Western Canada, it's a long way around, you know, to burn in Yorkshire, doesn't sound right to me. <laughs> and I live in Yorkshire, so there's nothing to do with Yorkshire, but so, you know, it, but the, we can't stop it happening, of course, so Drax is gonna be bringing this huge amount of biomass and just burning it. So I said, well, for heaven's sake, get the chemicals off first, and then you can burn what's left. If you burn what's left, of course, you get some energy, great. And then you've got ashes, and what the ashes are a real problem. Mountains of ashes are now accumulating from people burning biomass, 
no idea what to do with it. We're using it to make furniture. Ashes contain silicates. Silicates are really good binders. We extract the silicates and we bind things like straw together to make really good furniture boards. So we've worked with B&Q, we all know B&Q, to make kitchen furniture. We had to ship it all to China, which is kind of crazy because that's where they make their boards. So China's made some kitchen units which are now in a, literally, literally on a slow boat from Shanghai, eventually coming to the docks at Hull, I suppose. So we might eventually see this kitchen furniture. But the principle is there, you know? Even when you finish burning, you've got ashes, even the ashes can be useful. The ashes, by the way, also contain enormous quantities of metals. Some of those metals I showed you before are present in these natural ashes naturally. Amazing quantities of metals in the ashes we just ignore at the moment and think, oh my God, what do we do with them? We'll stick them at a landfill site, we'll get rid of them, we'll spread them over the land, even though they've got poor agricultural value. We can make porous solids from the same silicates. And there's our friend oranges I mentioned before. It's our, our little name game, OPEC, the Orange Peel Exploitation Company, because the world needs a new OPEC. <laughs> and... Uh, one of the publications we submitted, uh, we, one of the referee reports came back and said, well, the authors may find this amusing. Personally, I do not. And I thought, yeah, 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 great. You know, I was really pleased he got the paper because it was accepted, of course. And, uh, you know, the thing is, it's a bit of fun, sure, but the reality is there. 100 million metric tons of oranges process every year. And out of that comes about, well, you know how much waste there is if you squeeze an orange? A lot of it's waste. So why don't we make use of it? It's full of interesting chemicals, all sorts of things you can make. You can do it at school, so we work with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, an educational trust driven by Ellen MacArthur, the Around the World Yachtswoman. If you don't know it, do check out the website. And we've been working with schools to create experiments kids can do, because it's so easy, and everyone loves it. You know, microwave plus oranges gives you something useful. Like pectin, you can make marmalade with it, if you like. All sorts of things you can do with the products. Very simple to see. We have scale-up labs, which allows us to, this is our big microwave, I mentioned before, which is great fun. Um, and, uh, a little bit scary at times, but it's really very good. Allows us to kind of prove what we're doing. So back to the entrepreneurship thing, we have to show and prove to industry it's for real. We can't just take them in the lab and say, look what we've made. It's not enough. You know, industry wants to see it scalable. So we can take them into this place and show at big scale. We can take orange peels, it's 30 kilos an hour, and this is demonstrate a scale and make substantial quantities of stuff. You can then take away and test and really show this thing's for real. We do research, industrial collaboration, obviously, education, networking, all sorts of networks. So do join the biz. Again, a game, a bit of a game play here. We sort of play around with words of biz as our bio-waste industrial symbiosis network, all about this, uh, this uh, farm-to-fork concept, taking the waste streams, using them for useful things. And this is now a, a cost program. Some of you may have heard of this. It's a big European co uh, network program, which has just started actually literally this month. So that's something you can all join. It's all free of charge. The network itself, the Green Chemistry Network, has uh, various ways of getting the message across. This is our mascot, Fabs the Frog. So Fabs is a, he's green, of course, that's why. Somebody said to me, why do you use a frog? Well, he's green, you know. It's, <laughs> it's very smart. He occasionally becomes human. That's Jenny. So Jenny, one of our uh, graduated last year with a PhD, now works in Brazil, doing similar things in Brazil. So she was brave enough to wear the frog outfit. Very few of my graduates are brave enough to do that, which is, which is kind of sad. But uh, the kids love it. It's a very easy way. It's sponsored by Boots, who are also very into this sort of thing, which is great to see. So Fabs helps to get the message across, like, for example, some of those products I talked about before, like bubble bath. You know, where does it come from? Where does it go? You know, what happens to it at the end of life? So we, give the, we challenge the kids with a life cycle approach. Think about the resources. Think about the process, including you using it. And think about the end of life, the waste, after you've finished using it. An MSc course like the one here. All sorts of things going on at York. And there's the guys and girls, I mean, some of them anyway, from the group from uh, last year, 20 plus different nationalities. And of course, Imperial, of course, is famous also for being very multinational. And the great thing about green chemistry is it is very multinational. You know, wherever you go, for all the sorts of reasons I talked about before, be it in terms of what you use, what you're doing in terms of manufacturing, or the resources and future resources, like I mentioned, Brazil and so on, it's really important, it's relevant, and it's an exciting thing to do. Great, thank you very much.
Last year I tried to order some liquid helium. I got the shock of my life when they said there wasn't any. Yes, yes. Helium, of course, is a rare example of something that literally is leaving. <laughs> you know, it's literally going outside of the atmosphere and we can't get it back. There, is talk, there are new helium sources coming from the dreaded fracking. So actually, helium is kind of borderline as to whether it really is in that category or not. And of course, a lot of its applications are very trivial. I refereed a proposal recently for uh, use of helium in uh, party balloons, trying to find green replacements, which I kind of made me think about, you know, where it's being used. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I'm not quite sure that's sort of you know, ethically dodgy, that one, but uh, yeah. Um, you're right, it is, yeah, it is an issue. It's, it's, it's a bit specialised, um, but you're right, it is an issue, you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it wasn't two years ago, then it became, it is a bit borderline at the moment because of this, these new volumes coming out of fracking in the United States. But 